some should get plugged in, but our little daisy chain does not appear to want us to draw that much power. So that's the next iteration. So come back in January and I'll have probably worked this out. But we have a really awesome talk for you today, all about coral. Yeah. Yeah. Now? Yeah. Okay, so you have to hold it quite close to your face. Okay. <laughs> Microphone. Things. Okay, so Dom? Nope. No. So it's got to be something with this. everyone. to give you a talk about coral in the first place. So, um, I grew up in a small landlocked town in Pennsylvania. Um, Emily, sorry. Yes, sorry, just trying to make it more clear. Oh. Help me. All right, so I grew up in a small landlocked town in Pennsylvania, right about there-ish on the map. And um, as a small kid, I did enjoy zoos and aquariums, you know, like most of the children here probably appreciate going to the aquarium was a fun family trip, but um, I never actually considered a career in marine biology. Um, so like most young adults, when I um, started off after my under or after high school, I didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up. So I went to Community College of Philadelphia where I got my associates in arts in um, liberal arts, sorry. And basically while I was there, I took this class on conservation biology. And this class was super cool, it was super in depth, but what really inspired me was I actually ended up um, reading this paper by this woman named Ruth Gates. And if you've ever watched the movie Chasing Corals, the documentary, um, you may recognize that name. Ruth Gates is a premier scientist or was a premier scientist who studied coral reef evolution and genetics. And I was really, really inspired by this paper to the point where I said, that's what I want to be when I grow up. So I transferred schools to University of South Florida and got a bachelor's of science in marine biology. And while I was there, I double majored in Disney World. <laughs> All right, not really. Um, so I actually did intern at the US Geological Survey though, um, where I was able to work on corals. And some of the work I did there was looking at these large time scale differences of coral reefs. Um, and so this image here behind me is Carey's Fort Reef. And on your left, my right, um, is Carrie's Forest Reef in 1975 when it was a very healthy, robust reef. And what happens when reefs die is they lose structural complexity. And so I was really studying the difference between the structural complexity from that erosion that occurs over decades when the coral is no longer alive. Um, and so that was really interesting. I thought that was super cool. But what I really, really wanted to do was get into coral genetics. Um, so I became a PhD candidate here at University of Texas at Austin, where I study under Dr. Matz. Um, Dr. Matz is a like amazing coral geneticist, and he is my um, primary uh, professor. So with him, I am studying cryptic corals. So you might be like, what in the world is a cryptic coral? Um, so a cryptic coral is a coral that um, look the same but are genetically unrelated. So when you look at those corals together, you look at two of them and you'll say these two are definitely the same coral. They're definitely the same species. Hello? Okay. 
Um, and unfortunately, they actually are genetically very distinct. And this has some major ramifications in um, studying their conservation because it actually reduces the gene flow within the species. So my, my research, I don't know, with that? Maybe just talk loud. All right. All right. I think my, just yeah, talk all right. loud. I'm just going to talk really loud. All right. So <laughs> my research is the intersection between the genetics of these corals, so their nature versus the environment that they live in, so their nurture. So nature versus nurture. How important is it what this coral does is um, and how it reacts to its environment. How much is due to who it is, so it's genetics, it's nature, and how much is due to where it is, its environment or its nurture. All right, so this picture over here, this summer I got to go into the field in Florida Keys. Um, uh, that's one of our closer coral reefs here to where we live in Texas. And I got to study some coral bleaching, so pretty cool stuff. Um, and this is one of the types of figures that I make where I look at the relative fitness, which means how much did this coral grow based on what treatment it was in. So I put corals in a light treatment and a dark treatment and compared their genetics to their environment to see how fast they would grow under different treatments. Um, that being said, this talk is not about my research because I could talk about my research for days and if you have questions about my research, I'm more than happy to answer your questions. But this talk is more about the basics of corals. What are they? Why are they important? And what can we do to help them? So let's play a game. All right, so this game is, is it a coral or not a coral? So I'm gonna show you a picture on the screen and you're gonna shout out if you think it's a coral or not. So. Raise your hand or shout out if you think this is a coral. Not a coral. Coral. All right. We are divided. <laughs> it's a coral. So this is the coral Dendrogyra cylindris, also known as the pillar coral. It's a critically endangered species here in the Caribbean. Um, and it's super cool. It has these long polyps that stick out and kind of look wavy in the water. It's a pretty awesome coral. All right, let's try another one. Coral or not a coral? Coral. Yeah. Yeah. coral. 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 All right. I heard a lot of not a corals, and you would be right. It is not a coral. This is what's called a crustose coralline algae. So this coral is actually, uh, or not, this algae is more closely related to plants than just corals, to animals. All right, let's try another one. Do you think this is a coral or not? Coral! Coral, coral yes. She's very enthusiastic. This one it's is a, a coral. coral. Yes, this is the um, Apropra palmata, also known as the uh, elkhorn coral. All right, let's try another one. Coral or not a coral? Not, not a coral. coral! All right, yes, not a coral. This is Halamita, also an algae. All right, one last one. Coral! coral! Yes, coral. This is the coral that I study, Montastria cavernosa, um, AKA the best coral out there. All right, great job, everyone. So um, let's talk about what a coral is. So we're gonna do a little show of hands. So if you think a coral is a rock, raise your hand. Awesome, I love to see this. <laughs> All right, is it a plant? Raise your hand. All right, we got a couple. Is it an animal? Yes. Yes, oh, yeah, yes, I'm so proud of all of you. It is an animal. So a coral is an animal in the phylum Cnidaria, um, which are named for their cnidocytes. Um, so they are very closely related to jellyfish and anemones. Those are also other animals in that phylum. Um, and they all are stinging cells. So nidocyte is a stinging cell. Um, so it's a specialized cell found in some animals that has the ability to sting 
uh, when it comes in contact with certain triggers. So these cells are also called nematocysts, and I'm only pointing that out because some of the pictures that I used um, do call them nematocysts. So if you see the word nematocyst, it's the same thing as a nidocyte, and that's just the specialized stinging cells. Do y'all want to see what one kind of looks like? Yes. yes. Excellent. All right. So this is a nidocyte. So, sorry, I don't have a pointer. Um, <laughs> this tan box here is the cell. Inside that cell is a barb attached to a thread. And attached to the edge of that thread is a little hair-like projection. So just imagine you're a little animal out in a big, wide open sea, and you've got this tiny little hair projection sticking out, and something goes by and touches it. Out shoots the barb. So, do y'all want to see? Uh, so, the barb shoots out and actually it lodges into whatever the animal is stinging. And that's why jellyfish sting skin. So, we can watch a quick little video of some corals actually fighting for um, space on the reef using those cytocytes. You want to see the video? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Oh no, it started at the beginning. Technical errors, one second. Nice. One moment, everyone, while we prompt this video up for you. All right, so if the video doesn't work, that's okay. I'll describe what happens in the video. So basically, there's a coral sitting right about here-ish, and there's another coral right next to it. And so what happens is, is these corals only move when they're very young larvae. And once they've planted onto the ground, they no longer move. So they're stuck where they uh, landed as a very young larvae for the rest of their lives. And so what happens is this coral uh, starts touching the other coral and it starts stinging the other coral because it's encroaching on its face. Um, it's okay, Emily, don't worry about it. Um, we'll, we'll put the video up online for everyone to watch. <laughs> Um, so, it's a pretty cool thing that corals do, um, the, the ability to sting other animals that they share with jellyfish um, and sea anemones. So, another really fun thing that I really think is cool about corals is they're a colonial organism. And what this means is that they are made up of a bunch of really small polyps, and each polyp is genetically identical, and then it builds upon all of those polyps to make this giant structure that can be like anywhere from like one to three meters wide in the ocean. And that's a pretty cool thing. So you might be wondering what a polyp is. And a polyp is the sac like body of the coral. So this is kind of what the polyp looks like in a very two dimensional image drawn figure of the polyp. And it's made up of three main parts. So the first main part of the polyp um, is its mouth. So you see that up at the top, the opening in between the tentacles. It has, then it has the stomach, which is that blackish blob in the middle. Just, it's just like your stomach. It's where it digests all the food that it catches. And then it also has the tentacles at the top. Um, and so basically what happens is we have this polyp here, and this polyp clones itself. It divides into two polyps. And then we then those two polyps divide and become four polyps. And those four polyps divide and become tens of polyps. And those tens of polyps divide and become hundreds of polyps. And this process keeps happening over and over and over again until you get structures that look like this on the ocean. And I don't know, I think that's really cool that something that's so tiny, small as hold up your pinkies, everyone. A coral polyp is smaller than your pinky finger. Something that tiny can make reproduction and clone itself multiple times until it can make a structure that is big. this big or bigger. Pretty cool, right? I think it's pretty cool. All right, another cool fact about corals is they actually live with a algae inside of their cells. 
So this is a coral polyp. The coral animal is the clear translucent part of the polyp. And these tiny little green dots, that's algae that's living inside the cells of the corals. And each of those little algae are called zooxanthellae. And these zooxanthellae are a photosynthetic organism. This means that they take the sun, light, and they take some nutrients that the coral gives to them, and they turn those nutrients and that sunlight into sugar. They take that sugar that they make and they feed the coral with that sugar. So most of the food that a coral gets comes from the sugar produced by the algae that it provides safe harbor to inside its body. Um, and so, again, pretty cool. Let's review. So what is a coral? First, a coral is a um, animal with specialized stinging cells called cnidocytes. It also is a colonial animal made up of thousands and millions of polyps, and it has a symbiotic relationship with a single-celled algae called zooxanthellae. All right, so now we know what a coral is. What's a coral reef? So coral reef is a remarkable and intricate ecosystem that provides many numerous benefits to marine life and to humans. So coral reefs provide ecosystem services, and an ecosystem service just means it's some sort of benefit that the corals provide to either humans or the animals that live in the ecosystem that the corals make.
Um, and tourism to beaches and other coral reef areas brings in approximately $36 billion in, to the global economy annually. So that's a lot of money. Um, corals also provide a lot of recreation opportunities. So if you like to do deep sea fishing, um, if you like to go scuba diving or snorkeling, coral reefs are probably a place that you end up going to. Um, and so over 70 million trips are made each year to coral reefs for recreational amusement. That being said, you might be like, that's nice, but I'm not a beach person, right? Maybe not everyone's a beach person. Not everyone wants to go on a diving trip somewhere exotic. I personally don't understand, but you know, <laughs> to each their own. Another important thing that coral reefs provide are medicines. So medicines such as AZT and RSD, so antiviral and anti-cancer agents, are come from animals that are supported by coral reefs. We also have um, coral skeletons, so the coral animal itself makes an external skeleton, and that skeleton can be used as an agent for bone replacement by surgeons. Another fun one that I just threw in here as a bonus, uh, corals are really important for coastal preservation. So if you like going to the beach or you enjoy um, going to a resort somewhere, corals are really, really important for that. Um, they provide natural breakwaters, which reduce the impact of cyclones, hurricanes, tsunamis, typhoons um, on coastal regions. And they reduce coastal erosion by dissipating as much as 97% of wave energy. All right, so let's review and play a quick game. All right, true or false? Corals are, coral reefs are an exclusive <laughs> ecological club that only, <laughs> that only a few species use. Aww. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Yes, so coral reefs are home to thousands of fish and marine invertebrates. All right, let's try another one. What is the coral that makes the coral reef? Is it A, a type of underwater sea flower, B, an animal related to worms, C, a species of seaweed, or D, an animal related to jellyfish? D. Yes, D, an animal related to jellyfish. Remember, they both have those nidocyte specialized stinging cells. All right, let's try another one. What do corals <laughs> eat? Is it A, fish sticks, B, sugar, C, sushi, or D, fish sandwiches? No, no. All of the above. <laughs> it's sugar. Remember, they get sugar from those zosan belly that reside in their cells, that, those photosynthetic algae. All right, and then bonus question, because we didn't actually go over this, but I want to see how many of y'all here know the answer to this question. Which coral reef is found here in Texas? The flower Garden. Yeah, the Flower Garden Banks. Um, so the Flower Garden Banks are our own personal Texas reef. Sorry, you can go ahead. Um, so they are a beautiful sustaining reef that live off of a old abandoned um, oil rig and they are absolutely gorgeous. They support a lot of life. Um, if you are a scuba diver, highly recommend going out to see it. Um, yeah, just wanted to put that out there that we do have a coral reef here in Texas. Oh, invasive species. Yeah, lionfish. Great catch. Ooh. All right. So now we come to the sad part of our talk. What are the issues that are facing coral reefs today? Bleaching. Hot water. Bleaching <laughs> and hot water, yes. Um, so when the ocean water gets too warm, coral actually expel the algae, the zooxanthellae that live inside their cells. And uh, this causes the corals to turn completely white. And so while this may look beautiful in a picture, it's actually really bad. It means that coral, those coral right there are starving to death. And unless the water cools down dramatically pretty quickly, they actually will perish and 
no longer be with us um, and no longer be able to serve those ecosystem services that we talked about earlier. Another big issue facing corals today is disease. Um, so corals can become susceptible to disease when they're stressed due to changes in their environment. And I'm so fortunate to say that most of those changes in their environment are due to human effects. Um, so coral disease is often visible as a change in tissue color or tissue loss, which indicates death of the coral. So in this picture here, that white ring is a band of dead and dying tissue uh, around the coral. And the agents that cause coral diseases, so the bacteria or viruses, aren't very well known. Um, it's not for a lack of trying to study them, it's just that they're very difficult for us to actually isolate and identify what disease is causing a certain illness in coral. And then the last one I want to talk to you about is pollution. So pollution is a big problem with corals. It impacts them in many different ways. Um, so one way, as you can see in this picture here, plastics can smother coral reefs. They can also act as an agent for disease um, or as a vector for disease. So if there's a bacteria or virus on that piece of plastic that's now laying on top of that coral, it can transfer that bacteria or virus and get the coral sick. Um, nutrient pollution, which happens from runoff from fertilizers, so over fertilizing your garden, um, and over fertilization in agricultural farms, can cause um, algae bloom, so macroalgae grows a lot faster than coral can, and on a reef, space is a limiting factor. So when you have a plant that can grow a lot faster than this animal can grow, it'll actually outcompete the coral and take over and kill off all the available space for new baby corals to grow on that land. Um, and then pollution in general reduces water quality, making corals more susceptible to disease. It impedes coral growth and it reduces coral reproduction. So that being said, I don't like bad talk, so we're going to talk about what we can do here in Austin to help. Some actual, actual change that we can make here in Austin, Texas, even though we're so far away from the ocean, that can actually make a really big difference in the coral reef today. So the United Nations has six things that they say that every person can help do to reduce your uh, carbon footprint on this planet. The first is walk, bike, or take public transportation. So, how many people here drove? <laughs> yeah, most of us. And that's okay, because sometimes we go places where that's the only option we have. But next time you're considering going to the corner store to pick something up, that's only like a two minute walk away, maybe consider walking instead of uh, or taking your bike instead of driving there for convenience sake. Um, I'm not saying that you need to stop driving everywhere all the time because that's unfeasible and unrealistic, but just making that conscientious decision to just try to decide when can I replace some of my actions with other actions to better help the environment. Another thing you can do is eat more vegetables. Again, I'm not saying everyone should be vegetarian or vegan, but if you reduce some of your meat intake on a weekly basis, just replace out, you know, one meal a day or one meal a week with a plant-based option that can have a huge impact on your carbon footprint. You can also reduce, reuse, repair, and recycle. So reducing the amount of waste that we make actually helps keep trash out of our oceans. Most trash that's in our oceans isn't purposely put there, but it does happen when, you know, you throw something in the garbage, it blows out, and then it ends up in the ocean. So making a decision to reduce what your, your impact is can be really important. You can also save energy at home. So something as simple as switching your incandescent light bulbs out with LED light bulbs can save a lot of energy and reduce your carbon impact. 
the last uh, organization that I wanted to highlight is Omega de los Corrales de Tela. So this was actually founded by someone who works with my lab, with Dr. Mass, um, established by Austin local Julie Birdwald uh, to support Tela's coral reef. Um, so they collaborate with universities to study Tela's uniquely robust coral reefs and empower local the local community to protect their reefs. Um, again, I think this is a really great organization, and if you want to have just more direct impact on a coral reef, I think this is a great um, nonprofit to support. So, we've gone over a lot of different things today. What a coral is, what a coral reef is, some of the things that are impacting them, and most importantly, what we can do to help. And I really want to end with this highlight on the fact that there is a lot we can do to help, both individually and collectively. Um, so with that, I would like to say thank you. Um, so I'd like to thank Davey Flores, uh, Patrick Healing, Ben Lowry, Lisa Roseman, Prim Primov, and Kenzie Vandiver for their amazing pictures throughout this entire presentation. Um, and we didn't get to see the video, but uh, Kim uh, Filmgarts was really, really kind. Uh, I reached out to him to ask if I could feature his video in this talk, and he was super nice about it. So. Big shout out to Tim for that. And with that, I will take any questions. Let's see if this will work for questions. Okay. Who had the Columbia? Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Does it, does it the water? So is there salt water in the river? Um, there probably is salt water in the river, probably back flowing up from the ocean. Um, one of your early photographs where it was dated 75, you showed before, or you showed different time periods. Yeah. How deep was that water? Um, Carrie's Fort Reef is, that specific photo was about two and a half meters, so about seven, eight feet of water. Oh. Um, so, I've heard um, how some people will create, like, artificial reefs um, for coral to go straight back one story so that, like, in the future. How viable is that long term of solution? Is that sort of just like an emergency stopgap, or is that something that could one day be accelerated into a like large scale? Um, so, the issue with that is it's really hard to scale up. So, it's very easy to do um, in a very small, isolated region, but it's very difficult to apply that across areas such as like the Great Barrier oh. Reef. Ha, 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 ha.
but there are corals that are right in the vicinity of them. But corals fighting for space on the reef is actually a pretty, like, relatively new phenomenon that we don't know a whole lot about, um, which is why it's pretty cool that Pim was able to get a video, a time-lapse video of it actually occurring, because it's something, when we watch the time-lapse video, it looks like it's something happening over, like, a few seconds to a few minutes, but it's actually something that occurs over the span of hours to days, so... It's a very slow fight. <laughs> Do you have a favorite variety of coral? Uh, my favorite coral is the great star coral, Montastria cavernosa. It is a bouldering coral. Um, it's my favorite because it's the one that I study. So. <laughs> well, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you so much.